Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk. And this is going to be on serous cystadenomas of the pancreas. I notice that when I give conference on Wednesday and I show cystic pancreatic lesions, it's often a challenge. What could this be? Is it a serous cystadenoma, a mucinous cystic neoplasm? Is it a metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, perhaps, with a central necrosis? Is it a typical adenocarcinoma of the pancreas? Is it lymphopathelial cyst? It's interesting. When you look at cystic lesions, whether it's a main duct IPMN or side branch IPMNs or a lymphoepithelial cyst or a mucinous cystic neoplasm or a spend tumor or a serous cyst adenoma, each one of them has a classic appearance, which is really good. And many times you can make a very specific diagnosis. If you think about a spend tumor, the patient's 18 years old and female, there's not much choice. If you talk about a 45-year-old female, body of the pancreas lesion with thin septations, no dilated pancreatic duct, it's a mucinous cystic neoplasm. Certain times the lesions are perfectly classic the way they should be but a lot of times they're not classic. And so what I'm going to do in this talk, and it's going to be a multi-part talk, is I'm going to show you the range of serous cystadenomas. Now, in a typical talk, I might show you here's a serous and here's an MCN, here's an IPMN, here's a cystic neuroendocrine, and then perhaps the talk would be cystic neoplasms of the pancreas. Here's a range of possibilities. And I've given talks very similar to that we've recorded in the past. But in this talk, and it's going to be a multi-part talk, I just want to show you the range of serous cyst adenomas. I want you to get a good feel of how they look. So I'm going to show them to you, typical and atypical. I'm going to show you them with axial images. I'm going to show you them with coronal images. And I'm going to show you them with 3D images, including cinematic rendering. I want you to get a really good feel of what serous cyst adenomas can look like and perhaps that will help you in the future. Now, first, I'll go through some facts just to remind everybody. Serous cyst adenomas make up about one-third of pancreatic cystic neoplasms. 99% of the time, they're benign. And if you knew something was a serous cyst adenoma, assuming it wasn't causing symptoms because of mass effect, for example, you could leave it alone because it's not going to become a malignancy. The more common in women, the mean age is 62 years, typically present in the fifth to seventh decade of life. If you look at syndromes in patients with von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, which commonly have pancreatic cysts, about seven to nine percent of the cysts are serous cyst adenoma. But of course, VHL is an uncommon problem. There's lots of other findings from renal cysts to renal cell carcinoma and the like, but at least I'll mention that. When you talk about serous cyst adenomas, typically people break it into four categories. The microcystic, which is more of the classic one. Multiple cysts under two centimeters in size with septations and that classic honeycomb appearance. We talk about macrocystic, where there are multiple cysts over two centimeters. That can be a bit more challenging. We talk about a mixed micro and macrocystic, where some cysts are small and some are larger. And then we also talk about in that category where it's just a oligocystic, where it's just one big cystic lesion, which can be somewhat challenging and overlap with other findings. And then we talk about the most unusual or least common, where the lesions are solid and look essentially identical or almost identical to neuroendocrine tumors. And those are probably the hardest to diagnose. Now, findings on CT. Calcifications occur in up to 30% of cases. The classic is essential stellate calcification, but um, you know the more cases I see, the more we have a range of calcifications from multiple spotty calcifications throughout the gland to calcifications in the periphery. And the calcification pattern in general is just very variable. Serous cyst adenomas are more common in the body and tail, but we still see them in the head of the pancreas. And as I mentioned at the start of this talk, classic lesions are easy to diagnose, but many cases are just not classic. In terms of the pathology, serous cyst adenomas show low viscosity, low amylase levels, low CEA levels, 
with variable amounts of pancreatic enzymes such as amylase and CA-125. CA-72-4 level is low. There is work that has been done, particularly by the group at Pittsburgh, developing a test looking at the fluid of a cystic pancreatic lesion and being able to very specifically say it's a serous cyst adenoma. So in many cases, there's lots of work going on in pathology as well. And I'm not going to have time to talk about this in detail either, but we're doing lots of work with AI to potentially recognize serous adenomas based simply on their appearance using AI and things like radiomics to help us. I mentioned this slide before the opening. When we see a cystic pancreatic lesion, a lot of things go through our mind, things we think about, lymphoepithelial cysts or peripheral, there's no dilated duct, they almost look exophytic, spent tumors, younger patients, MCNs, patients are in their 40s, and we see thin septations, serous cystadenomas have a different appearance. And again, what I'm going to talk about is the common and uncommon appearances. We wrote an article a number of years back, Linda Chu, looking at the many appearances of serous cystadenoma, and it's a good article to review. Here are a couple charts from that article showing you the age range of serous cystadenomas, as we mentioned, with MCN being younger, but a lot of things do overlap. We talk about location, we talk about margins, we talk about unilocular versus multilocular, we talk about calcifications, we talk about the fact, and I'll show you exceptions, that communication with the main pancreatic duct, which is classic in side branch IPMNs, really doesn't occur with serous cystadenomas. But the answer is, that's in theory. I'll show you many cases where it does, where you can see dilated pancreatic duct and atrophy of the gland. We used to say atrophy of the gland, you're not dealing with a serous cystadenoma, that's not going to be the case. And as we mentioned, these lesions essentially never have malignant potential. 99 plus percent of them are going to end up being benign. We talk about some of the key features. Again, looking at cystic neuroendocrine tumors, that hypervascular halo, liver mets, clinical history, MEN syndrome are all things that push you and help you make that diagnosis without even looking at the images in detail. But then we talk about what we expect to see with serous cystadenoma compared to all of these other lesions. And I'm not going to go through all of the varying features of other lesions. And I think you could either freeze my lecture at this point and read through it or come back to it at a later date. Now, in that article, we say classically pancreatic serous cystadenomas have been described as multilobulated, multiloculated cystic masses with central stellate scars and calcifications. However, serous cystadenomas have a wide spectrum on CT, ranging from mutilocular masses to hypervascular masses, which can mimic other benign and malignant lesions. So again, it's kind of a chameleon, okay? So here's some of the things we think about the typical and atypical features, again, that central scar and calcification is great, but we don't see it all that often, and we can see atrophy. Again, duct communication is possible. Lesions can look aggressive. They can look vascular and almost simulate neovascularity till you realize you're typically simply seeing vessels being draping over the lesion, particularly things like the GDA, and I'll show you examples of that. When you think about the various patterns, microcystic pattern or polycystic pattern uh, is seen commonly in serous cystadenomas. Again, calcification, dilated pancreatic duct are rare, calcifications 30% of cases. So again, you can see that each of the articles does tend to have really a very lack of disagreement. People understand how serous cystadenomas should look, but also focus on the variability. So let's get started. Here's a complex cystic lesion, body and tail of pancreas, lots of septations, some faint calcifications, but the cysts are small and they're multiple. If you ask yourself, what else in the differential diagnosis can you be thinking about? 
This is not the look of MCN. It's not a neuroendocrine tumor. There really is nothing else. This is the classic honeycomb appearance, a little bit of stretching of the vessels, faint calcifications, just a really, really nice example of a cirrhosis adenoma. You can see why most of these cases are incidental findings, but others because the lesions get large enough can cause mass effect, particularly when they're located closer to the stomach or by the head of the pancreas. Very, very nice example. Another case, this was a patient with suspected aortic dissection. There was no dissection, but we found this large mass. You can see this dense central calcification. It's a mass over seven centimeters. You can see it has a dilated pancreatic duct, which makes you worry. But the more you look at the lesion, you realize the septations and the central calcification. Now, my experience is that we often do dual phase imaging evaluating pancreatic lesions, but the septations, particularly the smallest septations, the multiple tiny cysts, are better seen on the venous phase imaging than they are on the arterial phase imaging. The calcifications obviously will see well on either phase of acquisition. This case is a good example of that classic calcification. The classic septations, yet look at that pancreatic duct that's dilated. The bottom line is anything that's big enough can obstruct the pancreatic duct. And yes, this is a benign lesion, but there is duct obstruction and distal glandular atrophy. A beautiful example of a serous cystadenoma. You can see its orientation to the portal vein and SMV. It simply displaces the vessel at best, but there's no vascular involvement. And the honeycomb appearance is particularly nicely seen on the volume rendered images. So classic example of a serous cystadenoma with a few atypical features. Another case, cystic lesion body of pancreas with septations. You can see the distal gland is atrophic. As we look at the coronal view, you begin to see the multiple cystic spaces, the septations, even better than you do on the axial. Again, there's mild dilatation of the pancreatic duct. There's distal glandular atrophy. But as I show you more and more lesions, as you concentrate on the venous phase imaging, the septations are easier to see. And again, could this be an MCN in the right age group? You would consider that, but you typically don't see this many septations or cystic lesions with MCNs. You can see linear lines, linear septations, but not this cluster of cysts. Now, I have also found that on the cinematic rendering, which does texture mapping, you can see it very nicely here. It's often easier to see the patient's multiple cysts present. And it's easier at times to make the diagnosis of serous cystadenoma, very nicely shown here as well. So just a really nice example with texture mapping of a serous cystadenoma. Okay, and here it is again. And from a sagittal view, the same thing. Sometimes I find that the sagittal views are even better at showing you the septations, the multiple small cysts, Often it's choosing the best view. And so when we say, look at the axials, look at the coronals, look at the sagittals, and look at the three Ds, when you look at all of the images, you may have the best information possible. Now, another example. This patient had vague midline pain. So when you see a pancreatic lesion, you begin to worry. And it looks like there's some cystic changes, but there's a stretching of vessels along the periphery. Well, this was also a serous cystadenoma. Let's look at it a bit more carefully. On the coronal views, you see the stretching of the GDA, and you see the multiple cystic components within the lesion very nicely shown. You also can see how the vessels are somewhat stretched, but there's no neovascularity present. You can see very nicely the details of the cystic lesion, and this really is a serous cyst adenoma. On the venous phase, the cystic changes the septations are a bit better seen and particularly nicely shown on the coronal volume rendered views. Now, one of the things I've seen multiple times with serous cystadenomas is the scalloping along the portal vein and SMV. I can't call that a classic sign, but I think I've only seen that 
with serous cystadenomas, it's kind of a lobulation. And so when I see that and I see this appearance, I have no problem calling this a serous cystadenoma. Because the patient has symptoms and the size of the lesion, although we're not concerned about malignancy, this patient will get the lesion resected. Another patient, abdominal pain, cystic lesion body of pancreas with atrophy of the distal gland. Look how atrophic that distal gland is, particularly impressive. But as you look at the venous phase imaging and the more you stare at the lesion, the more you recognize the multiple septations in the lesion, the multiple cystic components, particularly nicely shown on these volume rendered coronal views and really nicely shown on the cinematic rendering. Just a really nice example, again, of accentuating the variable changes which allow you to be more specific in dealing with this as a serous cystadenoma. And again, the post-processing is easy enough to do. Here's another example. Large cystic lesion tail of pancreas kind of looks different than the rest, the way it comes off the tail and really enlarges the tail of the pancreas. And as you look through the images, lots of septations, small ones and big ones. But you go and say, what else could this be? It's not a neuroendocrine tumor. There's no vascularity. It's not the look of an MCN. It's not a lymphoepithelial cyst. It's not a... Um, adenocarcinoma, it's not metastasis. This is a little bit atypical, but a really nice example of a very large serous cystadenoma. Just really impressive. Now, let me make this the last case of this first part of the lecture. Abdominal pain, and you see this mass in the pancreas. At first glance, you say, could but I be dealing with an adenocarcinoma in the body? The tail of the pancreas is atrophic and there's a dilated duct present. Now you look at a few other images and the lesion looks not like your typical adenocarcinoma because there are septations. And the more you look at this lesion, the more you realize, wait, this is not a typical adenoca because adenocarcinomas are hypodense. They don't see the cystic septations. But again, I'm concerned because of the dilated pancreatic duct. I'm concerned because of the atrophy of the distal gland. Look how it looks in the coronal view. It's a mass, but am I convinced there are septations here or am I just overcalling it? You can see on the volume rendering, you can see the septations, but how do I know this is not a necrotic adenocarcinoma? It's a good question. I think this is a very tough case. That duct dilatation, the atrophy, the abdominal pain are all worrisome. Could I be dealing with an adenocarcinoma? Could I be dealing with a mucinous cystic neoplasm with malignant transformation? When you look hard in retrospect, perhaps you can see all of the tiny cysts present and you should suggest serous cyst adenoma, but there's no doubt no one's gonna stop at that point. So let's do this. Let's stop at that point and let's come back with this next case and let's look at a number of more cases, both classic and challenging. And with that, I'll see you in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.